once again, grateful to be here with all of you. Majestic beginnings for majestic beings. It seems that every great spiritual teacher comes to us with some measure of indication, a prophecy about that being's entrance into the world and the impact they're destined to have. And so with Son Kappa, it was no different. And Theosophy tells us simply and plainly who he was. So just for the sake of context, uh, a look at when, where, how. This is a ULT newsletter dated February 17th, 2020. And the chart is entitled The Lineage of Books of the 1875 Movement. And underneath the phrase, thus have I heard. And the phrase we know is considered to be the seal of authenticity. But below that, there's another subtitle that says tracing the lines of theosophical teachings through the world's sacred traditions. And on the right side, all the exoteric faiths are listed, uh, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, the Greek philosophers. In the center, the esoteric and semi-esoteric works that we're fortunate enough to know of and study the theosophical writings as well as the Indian scriptures, Upanishads, Brahmanas, Mahabharata and more. That are on the left side of the chart um, are listed the Mahayana Buddhist school and also the Vajrayana Tibetan Buddhist schools, including the Gelupa, which was started in the 14th century with the reforms that were introduced by Tsongkhapa. And so it's Tsongkhapa who is. Um, uh, history claims to be the end of the century reformer of Buddhism in Tibetan after it had gone into decline. And this supposedly was because uh, uh, of a lack of participation by lay people and also a growing materialization of uh, its tenets. And so there in the footnote at the very bottom of the chart, it states not only that Tsongkhapa founded the Tashilumpo Monastery, an esoteric school near Shigatse, Tibet. But most importantly, that Tsongkhapa was a later reincarnation of Gautama Buddha. So let me read a uh, part of a passage from an article about Tsongkhapa uh, that I found on the Theosophy Trust website. It says Tsongkhapa undertook two great tasks, the purification, preservation, and promulgation of the wisdom religion and the initiation of the seven century plan to prepare the world through mental and spiritual revitalization to be the seed ground for the formation of the distant six sub race. Tsongkhapa purified Buddhist thought of the superstitious and power seeking tendencies of the indigenous Bon sorcery, which had adopted Buddhist symbols and crept into Buddhist practice. In renewing the spiritual currents of Tibet, he founded the Ganden Monastery in Lhasa and established the Gelupa or the Yellow Hat Order. So as an agent of the Lodge of Mahatma Tsongkhapa knew that the esoteric doctrines reveal the true sevenfold nature of man and that correlations between principles, planes and beings gave the key to tremendous spiritual and physical power. His wish was not that the truth should be hidden but that the degradation of truth through abuse should not be allowed for fear of the terrible attendant karmic consequences during a cycle of spiritual darkness. The following is Tsongkhapa's pledge. Through whatever merit I have accumulated by love immortal, harmony in act, patience, effort, meditation, and wisdom, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all living beings. So lovely. But there's another story about Tsongkhapa, a prediction 
that is said to have come from Gautama Buddha himself, that Tsongkhapa, in a previous incarnation as a little boy, gave the Buddha a rosary. And the Buddha in return gave him a conch shell along with a prediction, which states that in a future life, the boy would be born in Tibet. He would become the founder of the great Ganden monastery. He would present a crown to the great statue of Buddha in Lhasa. And he would become the leading force in flourishing the Buddha doctrine in Tibet. All of this came about precisely as the Buddha predicted. And so here we have two remarkable statements about Tsongkhapa, one that he was the reincarnation of Gautama, the other, the prediction about him from Gautama Buddha himself. So who really knows how these beings come to us, come to be among us? The book Buddha in the Land of Snows lists 27 former incarnations of Tsongkhapa. And curiously, two of the beings listed there are considered to be his greatest influences and also the formation of the teachings that he gave out. One, the great adept Nagarjuna, uh, a major influence listed there, and another, the great teacher Atisa, also an important listed. Uh, also, the young boy who was said to have given the Buddha a rosary is there. The Tama Buddha is not there. But either way, it seems to convey the idea that the higher esoteric aspect of a great being can be incredibly economical and frugal in its effort to reach, to love, to instruct, and to care for humanity. So here's one more I thought would be nice, the family lineage dream photo. Some earthly facts, a J. Tsongkhapa uh, was born in Tsongkha, translated as the land of onions. And it was part of a larger region known as Amdo, the Northeastern part of Tibet that is now a province of China. In the book, Buddha in the Land of Snows, it states that the province of Amdo has a very long history of many tribes and regions, it seems to be portrayed here. And in particular, the place Songkha, after which Songkhapa was named, was considered to be, quote, a place of excellent attributes, unquote. Born the fourth of a family of six children, five boys, one girl, Songkhapa's mother, a born Tibet Tibetan devout Buddhist, known for her compassion and devotion her tireless rounds around the Buddhist temples, repeating the mantra, Om Mani Padme Om. His father, a born Mongolian, was from the well-known ancient Tibetan Mal clan, a clan that had the great tradition of their sons entering into the monastery. And it's stated in the book that at the time of Tsongkhapa's birth, the number of his paternal relatives that belonged to this Mal clan were said to be 1,000 people, very strong lineage. But uh, a look at the mystical events around his birth. Sometime in October, the year 1357, the firebird year, about a year before Tsongkhapa's birth, his father had a prophetic dream that a monk wearing robes made of garland flowers said he had come from a place called Wu Tai Shan, a mountain in Northern China that was said to be the abode of Manjusri, the great Buddha of wisdom. The monk was carrying a text that was wrapped in a cloth. And in the dream, he asked for shelter and then disappeared into a shrine room that was on the roof of the house. Tsongkhapa's father naturally thought that this was a blessing of Manjusri, um, due to the fact that he regularly recited chants, chanting the names of the deity. And then some months later, Tsongkhapa's mother dreamed about a procession of people playing drums, carrying banners, awaiting the arrival of Avalokiteshvara, the great Buddha of compassion. It said that there was a big, radiant, golden icon in the sky surrounded by celestial beings, and they all descended to earth. And as they did so, Avalokiteshvara dissolved into her body through the Brahmananda, the crown chakra of her subtle, subtle body. 
as the surrounding gods and goddesses circled her and chanted the sacred verses. These mystical dream experiences indicated, according to the Theosophy Trust article, that coming into the world was a being who was the emanation of both Avalokiteshvara, Buddha of universal compassion, and Manjusri, Buddha of universal divine wisdom. Lastly, one of his disciples wrote that Tsongkhampa was born when the morning star was in the bright sky and night was giving way to the day. Very symbolic. Now, Choje Dundrup Rinchen, a great Tibetan Buddhist monk, was traveling when this star appeared in the heavens and his divine perception gave him the awareness that an emanation of Manjushri had been born and he suddenly hurried from his travels, visited Tsongkhapa's family bearing gifts for the child from the nearby monastery. Gifts which consisted of a sacred painting called a tanka, of a great meditation deity, a protection string, and importantly, a letter to the parents containing advice on the need to raise this particular child with special care. This would be the first visit by the monk Cho Jae Rin Chen, uh, but it would be one of many as he became the sole instructor to the child Tsongkhapa until the age of 16. At the age of three, Tsongkhapa took the vows of the beginning, what's called the layman's vows. According to the Theosophical article, by the age of seven, Tsongkhapa had been in such deep communication, or rather, forgive me, communion, with the deities of the Vajrayana lineages of Buddhism, he then received the vows of the novice. What a delightful thing. This culture that formally engages children in spiritual studies and practices of such depth at such a young age, we know that Western culture engages the very young in spiritual manners, of course, but not to this extent where preschool age children are memorizing large swaths of scriptures and engaging in rituals in a way that builds a little fortress inside them. And if the world is fortunate in some cycle, even helping to bring forth a great teacher. So we found a few photos with quotes, one on how meditation alters our sense of and use of time. It says, you should sit in meditation 20 minutes a day unless you're too busy. Then you should sit for an hour. <laughs> and there's another uh, that is a quote from His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, which I thought, uh, which is a much needed idea in this time of the horrible violence we're learning about what seems like on a daily basis. It says, if every eight-year-old in the world is taught meditation, we will eliminate violence from the world within one generation. That's from His Holiness. Remarkable. Anyway, by the time Tsongkhapa was six years old, he was reading, writing, and memorizing liturgical texts, clearly taking birth in this culture and tradition was perfect for the unfoldment of the mission that he came to give. Okay. So now at 16 years of age, Tsongkhapa having taken vows at three, then at seven, having received his monastic name, Lob Sang Drakpa, which literally means excellent intellect and repute. He used this name for the rest of his life. And now, he had learned everything his teacher, Shoje, had to impart to him. Uh, an exceptional capacity for learning, comprehension, memorization, a natural feel for the mystical. Having memorized various texts and Buddhist works, he recited the mantra Om Arapachana Di, the mantra of Manjusri, over 100 million times. Remarkable. So this was a definite turning point for him. Tsongkhapa would never return to his home, Amdo, but now holding fast to his teacher's advice, which was to continue to seek out the deities he'd come into intimate connection with, 
he left home to embark on what would be a year long, 1300 mile journey to Lhasa, central Tibet, to take the Bodhisattva vow before the great image of Buddha there, and then engage in further studies. So I found two copies, two different versions of the great Bodhisattva vow. It's so uh, moving. Uh, the one on the left says, beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable. I vow to be it. And then the last says, for as long as space remains and as long as sentient beings remain until then, may I too remain to dispel the suffering of all beings. Monastic life. This is one of several photos found online. Uh, of monasteries, but for the most part, they're all built very high and into the sides of mountains. It, it, you can't imagine anyone having a single moment without inspiration in such a beautiful environment, immersed in incredible teachings. So the first stop in Tsongkhapa's grand tour of learning and ultimately teaching at some point at the great monasteries in central Tibet began with the Drigung Til Monastery. There he received and participated in the great central teaching of Buddhism, the ceremony of the generation of bodhicitta, the altruistic aspiration, which is the vow to attain enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. From there, he made his way to what was also considered a major learning center at that time, Duwachen Monastery, which was known at the time to be one of the six major centers of learning in central Tibet. During this time, this span of time from the age of 16 until around the age of 20, Tsongkhapa would make his way to and engage in studies and debates at more than 12 monasteries, each one of them contributing to his remarkable expansion of wisdom and compassion, as well as his remarkable skill in debate. And certainly, uh, at each monastery, people receiving uh, his amazing gift uh, in awe. The foundation of Tsongkhapa's monastic education was centered around a number of key Indian Buddhist texts out of which four scholarly disciplines came and they were put before all the students to master. One, the perfection of wisdom studies based on a work entitled uh, Ornament of Realizations, and that's attributed to Maitreya. Two, logic and epistemology, which is basically the study of knowledge, the study of the validity of belief versus opinion. Uh, three, Abhidharma, Buddhist psychology and metaphysics which was based on the texts of Asanga and Vasubandhu, and finally four, a system of ethics and monastic discipline, Vinaya. Anyway, the students would memorize the texts, receive clarity from the commentaries. <clears throat> what would we be able to understand without the great commentaries? They'd undergo debate, debates with other students, and this method is still engaged in today uh, at Tibetan monastic colleges. Our theosophical classes, of course, we don't debate, uh, sort of echo this process. We get enormous help from the commentaries in the SD. We're made aware of source material for the sake of comparison, if we want. And our discussions and listening to one another, mostly to you long time in students, which is wonderful, um, it, it gives us more clarity. Anyway, if the student completed and mastered all four of these disciplines and they successfully sat for debates, they were then to receive the title of Kashipa, master of the four treatises. In the book, it states that it is appropriate to stop and mention here because it's so very important that the philosophy of Nagarjuna, 
who was a major influence upon Tsongkhapa, uh, specifically regarding um, the view of emptiness, the middle way, um, was not yet listed among these disciplines at the time because it hadn't yet become a formal part of the curriculum in the monasteries. But over time, it did become so, and Tsongkhapa would emerge as the leading authority <coughs> on so this was a period of gestation for Tsongkhapa as he continued his studies and engaged in debates on his tour of the monasteries, his power, his excellence, and notably his fame grew stronger and wider and even faster. As students and teachers marveled at him, considering him to be, quote, a great wonder and his intellect uh, unfathomable, they said. His, his abilities were distinctly far beyond normal. One thing to note was that he didn't need to stop and reflect in response to questions. His responses flowed out of him with an immediacy, powerfully and eloquently, a decided surety as well as humility. At 19, Tsongkhapa would sit for his first formal debate and he'd make his way from one monastery to another, taking full advantage of the opportunity to learn uh, from great teachers, and there were certainly more than a few great ones, but here one stands out, the great Bhutan of the Shallow Monastery, just south of Shigatse, Tibet. The great Bhutan had many contributions to Tibetan Buddhism. He wrote a history of Buddhism in India and Tibet. He cataloged the complete Tibetan Buddhist canon, and he was also considered to be a guardian of many of the lineages of disciplines in Tibetan Buddhism, notably the Guya Samacha, which is very important. So let's take a look at Guya Samacha. According to an article by Alexander Berzin on the website studybuddhism.com, this is what Guya Samaja is what Tsongkhapa wrote most about, or he wrote a lot about. Here's what uh, Mr. Burson said. The name of Guya Samaja means assembly of hidden or secret factors. Guya means secret and Samaja means assembly. When we say the word secret, it's not as though, oh, you have to keep this secret. That's not the main flavor of the word. What it means is that it is naturally hidden or obscured to those who are not ready or able to understand it. Hidden because of its language, but also in terms of teaching it, you should keep it hidden from those who are not yet ready to understand it. And the assembly of these hidden factors can refer to all the deities within a belief system, or it can refer to the three main hidden factors within all of us, often called the three vajras, vajra body, vajra speech, vajra mind. This referring to the enlightened or the enlightening aspects of these three. And so there are two ways of referring to that in a sense, body, speech, and mind, we can say have been, been developed to the point of vajra, the stage of enlightenment, but you can also say with body, speech, and mind, I seek to help and enlighten others. Also, I found the definition of Vajra, uh, one definition it refers to a sacred weapon. Uh, and another, it means diamond-like, adamantine, unconquerable, which is a strong clue, I thought was another word. So it seems to convey the idea of purity, light, strengthened to the point of will for the purpose of enlightenment. So I, this student found this particular discipline, Guya Samaja, to be astounding. It is a remarkably difficult undertaking. And Tsongkhapa considered himself to be, and was con certainly considered by others, to be a Guya Samaja yogi, basically. Guya Samadhi uses and gauges at first uh, the imagination in the process of dissolution uh, in order to reach that place in our consciousness, the Buddhic state of consciousness of pure light by purifying and strengthening one's spiritual and subtle condition. 
what the yogi does at first is use the imagine the imagination in a process of dissolution from the most physical aspect of oneself to the most subtle enacting the same process that happens at death where we first release uh, the coarse level of matter, the body, and continue on until we get to what is called the clear light. The use of the imagination has a twofold purpose, though, in that it does bring us to more and more subtle levels, but it also prepares the aspirant for the process happening in reality, not just in imagination. In other words, the yogi can learn to consciously activate the process of dissolution from grossest level to the most subtle, stop short at death and use the process to get to what is referred to as the clear light. Except in, instead of actualizing death, the soul reaches the clear light. And the clear light is what allows uh, the yogi to perceive the right view where uh, negatives, that may have been obscuring that view have been removed through this process. So the assembly of hidden or secret factors, they can include all the subtle energies, the chakras, the subtle bodies uh, in the, in, or in another system, 32 deities on uh, the inner planes. In either case, the imagination is used and this level of imag imagination is far beyond what we think of as imagination it takes enormous power and ability of concentration, even that being something that has to be built up over incarnations. It is this buildup, this enormous laser-like focus that enables the yogi to tap into the more subtle forces within himself, the winds that flow through our subtle centers enable the yogi to generate heat the term being tumo is called, to purify, get beyond, and remove anything that obscures the Buddhic consciousness within us. Amazing thing, the power to simulate the process of death and make use of that process to access greater and greater light and wisdom. So to wind up Tsongkhapa's incredible tour of the monasteries now, 20 years of age, having grown in power, wisdom, and certainly fame, he'd come in contact with great minds, received many empowerments, initiations. He'd gained mastery of over disciplines. He found that a particular monk had a copy of a commentary on Maitreya's work, The Ornament. And wanting to study the work with uh, Nayawan himself, he made his way to that monastery and made it his primary residence. This was his first settling in. And he was elated uh, at having the opportunity to study the commentary with the actual author. And so after they had completed that, he then asked him if he could study another work with him, a work called Vasubandhu's Treasury. And Nayawan, who, uh, at this point was a very old man, replied that his health wasn't the best and given that he other, had other commitments, it wouldn't be possible to continue the study. Um, and so he said, listen, I know a guy. No, he didn't say that. He said, I have a most discerning student by the name of Rendawa, who is extremely learned in Abhidharma. Abhidharma is the term that means higher doctrine and it denotes the scholastic analysis of religious teachings. So apparently Rendawa was, uh, this is, was his area of, uh, of mastery. And um, Tsongkhapa decided that he would make his way to study with this master. Okay, let me see. Yes, Rendawa, Master of Abhidharma, 1349, 1412. The relationship between them would last their whole lives and it was one of great respect and honor. Uh, it says that Tsongkhapa had found the teacher who could 
replace his first teacher, Choje. And in the book, it's noted that in some way, Tsongkhapa had been going from one monastery to another in search of a teacher with whom he had a karmic connection. And this was also uh, important because it was from Rendawa that Tsongkhapa became aware of these beings referred to as the great charioteers in the tradition of Arjuna, Asanga and Nagarjuna and his Madhyamaka philosophy, the path of the middle way, a very important influence for Tsongkhapa in that his own teaching, his own attainment and his own breakthroughs in consciousness were strongly connected with and ignited by these ideas that had been put forth by these two beings, particularly Nagarjuna. So for all these reasons, Sankapa considered Rindawa to be his main teacher and they remained close all their lives. A tremendous respect between them. Uh, in the book, Buddha in the Land of Snows, the story is told of how one summer during a retreat, Sankapa composed a poem for Rindawa, a four line praise and he offered it to the master in turn Rindawa then changed a few words and gave it back to Tsongkhapa, stating that the praise was actually more fitting for Tsongkhapa himself. This is how it reads. You are Avalokiteshvara, the great treasury of objectless compassion. You are Manjusri, embodiment of stainless wisdom. You are the crown jewel among the learned of the land of snows. I supplicate at your feet, O Labsang Drakpa. Then a third line was added. You are Vajrapani, the destroyer of all dark forces. And today, uh, this uh, supplication prayer to Tsongkhapa is chanted by all members of the Gelug school, known as Miksema. And it is the foundation for a uh, genre of guru yoga practices that are connected with Tsongkhapa. Uh, and that is the chant that I played for you at the, at the very beginning. One last point about Rendawa. Um, Tsongkhapa was asked by another monk, Lochen, about his teacher, Rendawa, what special attributes did he possess? And Tsongkhapa replied, obviously all the qualities of a teacher. And then Lochen asked him, well, what of a personal example of what he was like? And Tsongkhapa replied that ever since he had met Rendawa, he had not experienced one moment of anger. And this had been Rendawa's impact on him. And as he relayed this truth, he was moved to tears. And the monk Lochen seeing this was in turn also moved to tears. So Tsongkhapa had been away from home uh, at least three years. He'd received a letter from his mother saying uh, it had been too long since she had seen her son. She was getting old and wanted him to come back home. She wanted to see her son again before her death. And this saddened Tsongkhapa. So he uh, at first put things in motion to travel to see his mother and then Midstream, he changed his mind uh, with the conviction that he felt the right thing for him to do was to stay and continue on with his studies. So he created uh, something unusual. He, cre he created uh, uh, a self-portrait using um, ink mixed with some of his blood from a nosebleed. And it was said that when the self-portrait unfurled, it actually uttered the word mother. And he sent the portrait along with other gifts uh, to remember, to his mother to remember him by. And though saddened that he couldn't return, she was very moved by the effort he made. But um, a note here uh, that at some point his mother had a stupa built. A stupa, if I understand it correctly, is a structure uh, built for meditation. Uh, and she had this stupa built at the site of Tsongkhapa's birth. And she made uh, a gift of the self portrait to the stupa, the stupa and the uh, community there. 
So after deciding not to return home, Tsongkhapa went into a solitary retreat and engaged in studies, uh, in particular, uh, the text on logic and epistemology, the philosophical study of the origins and limits of human knowledge, uh, using a text entitled Exposition of Valid Cognition. This study, it says, deepened his faith and his understanding of the Buddha and his teachings. And he emerged from this retreat with profound experience. And it says, just in time, sadly, sadly uh, to return to the monastery where he had his first debate experience, only to find that the community had become divided into opposing factions. Uh, this is how it is referred to in the book, Buddha in the Land of Snows. And the two factions had become involved in intractable disputes. So imagine emerging from a retreat in a state of what you could maybe call ultimate peace and reconciliation only to find, and in a monastery at that dissension. The saddened him to see this happening. And here is the first poem of his, the student found to be moving. It says, the sun of the correct view appears to have set now. The learned ones who used to show the truth have passed away, alas, who can uphold the Buddha's doctrine now? If one speaks the truth, he is viewed as pretending to be learned. If one speaks distortedly, false views will proliferate. If one remains silent, no aims are accomplished. Alas, how is one supposed to uphold the Buddha's doctrine? A sad state of affairs for him to have to witness this, but a few things had happened with Tsongkhapa, his faith, in the Buddha had deepened, his confidence in his own scholarship had increased, his gratitude and appreciation for his teacher Rindawa regarding uh, the Abhidharma, the higher doctrine as it's called, had strengthened and now well-deserved for his very hard work at understanding he was given the title of Kashipa, master of the four dis disciplines we spoke of. And it was during this time that Song Kapa began to accept students of his own. Still under his teacher Rindawa's careful hand, he continued to study with him, the Madhyamaka and the philosophy of Nagarjuna and the Abhidharma. So the, the book says that this intention and effort on his part uh, demonstrated an amazing dedication to gaining mastery in these subjects, yet, he even went beyond this. He needed to, it's just moved beyond the parameters of Rindawa and other teachers to get to expositions of other texts out of Nagarjuna. So he really worked hard at finding all that Nagarjuna uh, had to give. And Tsongkhapa was an extraordinary poet and in uh, Buddha from the Land of the Snows, there are references of the construction of Sanskrit poetry some of which is defined as having 36 different types of methods of construction, which uh, this student found to be an amazingly potent world of conscious creativity. Uh, and later, uh, Tsongkhapa would be hailed as one of the greatest poets of the Tibetan language. Okay, where are we? So in the year 1379, Tsongkhapa went into yet another solitary retreat, the sole focus being the great goddess of wisdom, poetry, and the arts, Sarasvati. He repeated the mantra to the goddess Sarasvati more than 50 million times. <laughs> Amazing. It is said that he experienced visions of the goddess and then he composed the following poem. With eyes like darting bees on a lotus-like face, sporting a glowing moon atop your hair arranged in a bun, you assume the playful pose of a dancer, O Sarasvati. Pray, continue to grant me proficiency in words. His solitary retreat with the focus on Sarasvati brought about a serious and lasting change for him. Also, there was a distinct change in his writing, it is said, an increased eloquence. 
And word had spread like wildfire that Tsongkhapa had this connection with the goddess Sarasvati. And now people were, were flocking to him to receive the blessing of the goddess. So here at 23 years of age, he had received the complete vows. He'd become fully ordained, a bhikshu, a full-fledged monk with all the completed requirements that had been established by Gautama Buddha in India 19 centuries ago. I march is on. So what was it like to be in the presence of Tsongkhapa? How did people perceive him? It's said that Tsongkhapa was very tall uh, and with so much power and accomplishment, he must have had a commanding presence. In the book, Buddha in the Land of Snows, it says that whoever met him felt what was described as his naturally compassionate nature. It says he treated students with patience and kindness in answering their questions. It said that there were numerous instances where just by being in his presence, students would experience a spontaneous progress in their own spiritual practices, that seeing him brought joy and peace. Remarkably, it also speaks of his amazing eloquence, a natural melody in his voice, it said, that projected very far, so far that people who were sitting at the edge of a crowd could hear him clearly. It said that even days after his teaching sessions, the monks felt that they could still hear the melody of his voice. A humble, gentle spirit. Uh, it's written that even after he'd become one of the most important religious figures in Tibet, he remained this way and would be so all his life. So in learning about Tsongkhapa and preparing for this, I was introduced uh, two articles about him found in the Theosophy Trust Memorial Library and also the two books, one entitled Buddha in the Land of Snows, uh, the forward by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the other written by Tsongkhapa himself, the Lam Rim, the great stages on the, sta uh, on the path to enlightenment. Uh, and in these writings, Tsongkhapa gives full credit to his influences, the masters, who came before him, uh, who evolved specific ideas. Uh, the great Indian master and scholar Atisha and also Nagarjuna, uh, whose teachings about the view, uh, perception of reality was very, very important for him. So here, Tsongkhapa expresses his own frustration frustration in conveying these ideas that are just amazingly complex. Uh, he not only expresses his own frustration uh, with an amazing humility, but he also uses that frustration to encourage others. And he says, this profound truth is most difficult to fathom indeed. My intellect is limited and my perseverance weak. Therefore, if there are any shortcomings in this work, I offer apologies for them from the depths of my heart. By whatever virtue I may have created through this effort, pure as the whiteness of moonstone and night lily, may all beings tightly chained by extreme views easily attain the view that is free from extremes. May the Buddhist teaching be upheld by countless masters who realize the truth of dependent origination. So it seems that it's important to remember that this view uh, spoken of, uh, this perception of reality adopted by one on the path, uh, is not something that is adopted as a favorite opinion, but a state of consciousness achieved a perception of reality that comes about as a result of the combined hard work of scholarship, meditation, reasoning, and ethical behavior, all of which adds up to a perception that is earned, having dispelled whatever negative karma that would obscure this clear perception. And it seems we are to bear in mind that this can also be 
a positive obscuration because we're never to be without the pairs of opposites in manifested existence. Just a little bit more about uh, Tsongkhapa's great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment. Uh, we know from the secret doctrine about the three fundamentals, particularly uh, the third one that states that every soul is on an obligatory journey, taking on embodied experience for the sake of becoming spiritually conscious. But I had no idea, this student had no idea how far this uh, idea really goes. In Tsongkhapa's great treatise here are what's called the 12 factors of dependent arising. And once again, we're to embrace the idea that everything is manifest that is manifested is the result of a cause and is temporary as put forth in the, uh, the secret doctrine law. But what is made clear in um, the Lam Rim, in the treatise, uh, is that not only are there 12 factors that come into play because of our ignorance uh, th that have us on a seemingly endless wheel of rebirth, making and unmaking karma over and over again, but also that part of what's called in the secret doctrine obligatory is that we have this karmic obligation to experience and complete all 12 of these factors not a few of them, and that there are numerous lifetimes involved in completing them all. So having read this, the term obligatory had a, a, a whole new meaning. Uh, and I have to say it made me laugh, but it absolutely rang true to me when a friend expressed to me that this teaching, the 12 factors of dependent arising, is the original version of the 12-step program. I thought that was just too funny, but true. Another amazing idea in the book for the student was embracing what's called a life of leisure and opportunity, which certainly does not mean uh, brunch and shopping, but talks about creating access to the ancient wisdom teachings by embracing the ethical behavior and discipline, creating the karmic opportunity to embrace the path. Wherever we find ourselves, we can create a reality that allows us to embrace the teachings relatively unimpeded, if not altogether. So we're never to take for granted the spiritual aspiration and love for the divine, for the path of ancient wisdom, because the very connection can set our will. It can help us to set our will and give us the karmic opportunity to pursue the wisdom. Uh, it's certainly possible to have the karma to be completely outside and away from the path, involved in the most mundane nose to the grindstone circumstances, focused only on things of the earth. So much gratitude for the tie. Oh, this is uh, a poem that is in response to um, the idea of opportunity and leisure. And so, so Kampa, uh, Song Kapa says, with behavior such as mine, I will not attain a human body again if I do not attain it. I will commit sin and never be virtuous. If I do not cultivate virtue, even when I have the chance to do so, what virtue will I cultivate in a miserable realm, completely confused and suffering? If I cultivate no virtue and accumulate sins, I will not hear even the name happy realms for a billion eons. So a little frightening, just a little nudge. So here, I just wanna talk a minute about this important moment in um, Sokapa's journey. Over time, at first through monks who served as mediums, and at some point directly, Sokapa made contact with 
uh, Manjusri, the great Buddha of universal wisdom. In the year 1397, he had made remarkable progress, cultivating the view and seeking deeper insight through meditation, scholarly pursuit and reasoning. He had consulted Manjusri several times and at this time, the deity gave him an instruction saying he should indeed reflect on the treatises and compare with Manjusri's oral instructions. It says, when you have gained, Manjushri tells him, when you have gained conviction on a given point through scripture and reasoning and come to a conclusion, if no qualms remain, even in the deepest recesses of your mind, then your analysis is complete. From now on, ensure that whatever activities you might engage in through the doors of body, speech, and mind, you do so for the welfare of the Buddhist teaching and sentient beings. So after this meeting and this uh, instruction, he, Tsongkhapa had a dream, much like the one his father had before birth. He dreamed that Nagarjuna, from whom uh, he learned so much about the correct view, was in deep conversation with his interpreters. And one of the interpreters came over to Tsongkhapa with a text wrapped in cloth as his father had dreamed and touched the top of his head with it. So give me one second. Here is uh, Sankapa's response uh, to his breakthrough, what he experienced. He says, all of a sudden, everything became crystal clear. All of Sankapa's longstanding doubts, especially regarding how to find the extremely fine line, demarcating what is negated in emptiness and what is left untouched, vanished without a trace. He felt that nothing whatsoever was left for possible objectification, no object, no basis, no ground. Yet there was no danger, not even the slightest hint of collapsing into nihilism or some kind of ineffable absolutism. Paradoxically, instead of being demolished, the world of cause and effect, right and wrong, samsara and nirvana seemed more clear and regulated. So he, after this experience, he wrote about it to his teacher, Rendawa. And Rindawa wrote back to him with uh, a, 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 an important thought. He says, remember that meditation deities reveal what is suited to the mental stage of the person. So do not be content with gaining some realization just once. But when you have gained insight into this view, convictions pertaining to causality and emptiness will arise simultaneously. Furthermore, since what is to be abandoned as well as its antidote, both have been realized to be rootless and groundless, even the notion that they are adventitious and exist as illusion-like dependent or in originations will come to be abandoned. So a few of his accomplishments between the years 1406 and 1408, he had the first idea of creating a great prayer festival. So from that time on, he'd set aside offerings he'd received from devotees, and he also sought the help of benefactors. He had already put together two smaller festivals that would come to be considered rehearsals for the grand festival he intended. He'd received all the necessary support to accommodate the huge crowd of monastics that were expected to gather. He sought the best artisans and craftsmen, everything needed to restore the sculptures and the murals at the Jokheng Temple, fine silk for the statues, crowns of silver and gold. There was a major effort to restore the temple to its former glory. Tsongkhapa created a compilation of texts 
from the sutras and other Indian uh, works. He composed dedication prayers uh, for the deceased, uh, also for the living, dedicating the merit of those who supported. By the end of 1408, Sankapa, along with 500 monks, accepted an invitation uh, to travel to see Miwang Drakpa, who was considered at this point the king of Tibet. And he would seek his support. And while there, he would teach from his great treatise. Returning in 1409, he received the enormous support from the king, who then issued a decree about the upcoming festival, instructing the ministers to help. And about 8,000 monastics came to participate, participate, including those from his home, Amdo. The prayer festival was a great success, a celebration of Buddhist performance of miracles. And it took place over a period of 15 days. In addition to the 8,000 monastics, there were crowds of over 10,000 people. And the festival, as said, was a resounding success. So he had realized his aspiration uh, to restore the temple in Lhasa and to regenerate, more importantly, the Buddha's teachings and faith in the Buddha. And for some years, the festival was held every year. It was interrupted uh, at a certain point because uh, the Geluk monks were banned from the festival. Uh, it, it, a political mess and then re resumed again until uh, the upheaval of Tibet because of the political tragedy uh, regarding China. But after many Tibetans left uh, Tibet and went to India uh, after 1959, the prayer festival continued. Uh, and over a period of time, uh, there began a tradition where those seeking degrees from the Gelug monasteries would sit for examinations between the formal sessions of the great prayer festival. So he accomplished what he set out to do in spite of the world's uh, disasters. The other great accomplishment that would shape uh, Sankaba's legacy was the Gandin Monastery. It was called the Mother Monastery. This was in 1409. Sankapa was aging and experiencing health issues. Uh, during the prayer festival, he paid particular, particularly close attention to his dreams, uh, seeking uh, uh, information about the creation of stability for himself and for the monks. Uh, and he had made two, two decisions as a result of this. One, that the monastery would be built on Wangla Mountain and it would be named Gandin, which means land of joy. Uh, and the other, uh, that the site would be visited uh, by many people. Uh, when he went to uh, the area where the monastery was built, uh, it said he fell completely in love with it. He performed rites for the construction of the monastery, formally requesting the earth and local spirits there and expelling forces that might hinder the process of construction. And once the ceremonies were accomplished, uh, he put two of his most trusted monks in charge and the work uh, took off. It went extremely well. Uh, and part of the complex was completed before the uh, end, before 1409. Uh, let's just a little bit more. He had composed two rule books on monastic life. Uh, one uh, was how they would treat one another, how they would treat visitors to the monastery. There was to be no shouting, the everyday life of the monk was committed to study, contemplation, meditation. And he now began to think of how he could further his mission to develop a lineage that combined the three spheres, the study and critical reflection, the meditation, and the active engagement in the welfare on behalf of others. So with Sankapa, this meant the union of both sutra and tantra.
Rindawa, his teacher had written to him asking for information. Tsongkhapa responded saying that he wanted uh, to give him the information in person, but this was not meant to be. He would never see his teacher again as sometime after their communication, uh, Rendawa, his lifelong teacher had passed away. So time after that, Tsongkhapa also took ill while at the Gandan Monastery. Um, he was incapacitated for a while, unable to teach, but he recovered completely and then began to write and teach again. Uh, there were more accomplishments from him, teaching festivals, construction of the Yang Pachin ten Tantric Temple, um, and the build, building of mandalas and deities uh, and golden statues of Manjusri and others. Gandan Monastery and the annual rites came to be known as the fourth of the four great deeds of Tsongkhapa, the other three, the restoration of the Maitreya temple, the great scriptural, scriptural festival of Nya, and the great prayer festival of Lhasa. They continued uh, to flourish until, of course, 1959, when Tibet experienced the political tragedy. But today, uh, Gandan Monastery is reestablished in southern India. Uh, he would remain at Gandan and continue to write his last writings there. Uh, he began to take ill and decided to take a trip to the hot springs for, for relief. Uh, he made a few stops in a few different enclaves to teach. Uh, he then returned home to Gandan after all the obligated public events were over and once again, Tsongkhapa took ill. So in the book, Buddha in the Land of Snows, it says the next day in the company of his closest disciples, Tsongkhapa grabbed his yellow hat, threw it into Gyal Tsap's lap, a trusted monk. He then gave his ceremonial gown to him and anointed him as his successor. He then went on to say, please understand the point that I am making here. Everyone should always practice bodhicitta. And this is what he wrote before he passed on. For those students who might be saddened by not having met me in person, I would say this, read the two syntheses I have written one on Sutra, the other on Tantra. If you do so, this will be no different from having met me in person. In these texts, I have condensed the essence of all 84,000 teachings of the Buddha and explained them in an integrated way. So even if you had not met me in person, I would have nothing more to say beyond what is found in these works. This is Gandan in India. Namaste. Wow. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I have about 800 questions. <laughs> I hope I have 800 answers. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we could. Do you want to, um, what do you call it? Take Unshare. the share off? And, uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, you, can always, you can always go back if somebody wants to refer to a slide. I don't know. Uh, find that green thing again. and. Oh, okay. Stop share. There we go. I'm sorry, everybody, for the lousy beginning. Wow. Oh, you've got nothing to apologize. That was just magnificent. OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, OK, gosh. OK, we have a common, beautiful, beautiful presentation. Thank you so much from Thank Susan. Um, 
Would you be willing to take questions from the audience? Sure, I'll do my best. I have a question, by the way, one of my 800. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it sounds like uh, what I, a recurring theme that I kind of picked up was the influence of great beings um, and on each other and on people around them. Um, first of all, you're talking about uh, Rindawa and the influence of those two beings, right? They're kind of the re reciprocity there. Yeah. And that, that made me think of the, uh, the Rumi presentation last year. He, he had this kind of special teacher being in his life. Um, mm -hmm. and I forgot that, that person's name, but something like that. And, um, and also, but um, Tsongkhapa, he would, um, he thought about Sarasvati, right? And that kind of opened up some kind of soul deep stuff in him. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit more. It's just, um, it's almost like, that's another thing that, that occurred to me is that his influence on people would tend to, to wake up soul uh, reminiscences or something. Sorry, that's the best I can oh, do with the question. No, no, that's okay. Yes, it um, it seemed that, um, well, you know, a spiritual master with a lot of practices under his belt is going to have a power of attraction that is very strong it, it, to the student's mind. That's how I see it. And so what happened to him uh, was that, I mean, anybody that will repeat a powerful mantra a hundred million times, first of all, where is your, where your dedication and your devotion has to be to even go for it in that particular way, such a gorgeous thing. But it would seem to me, he already, because he uh, had so many practices, already had this uh, emanation, this ability, this uh, attraction. But when he went into uh, solitude and retreat with um, Sarasvati, it increased. And it, 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 that seems to be a message of some sort. You know, all that he had done maybe on his own, absolutely, uh, had an impact and was helpful to other people. But to uh, devote himself to this deity and this force in the universe, it just took him to another level so that it seems that, because we all have Saraswati inside us, all the powers are inside of us, however minute and uh, asleep uh, we, are, we may be to them. But it seemed that when he did that, when he came out of that retreat, it put in motion uh, a wakeful attraction to him on a whole other level. So people who needed maybe the next step in their own sadhana, maybe people who needed uh, to, uh, to understand something complex that had been bothering them, uh, that they couldn't solve on their own. They seem to instinctively know that he embodied enough force to give them an answer. And that's why they were flocking to him in that way. That's my take on it. I, I don't know if anybody else would see it. I have um, somebody submitted kind of anonymously. Um, someone who does um, brilliant things and calls them experimental. Um, <laughs> uh, that says, um, even though you're a better reader than I am, I'll just, I'll just read it in the chat here. I put it. Oh, Give let it me go. Well, you, why don't you go for it? Why don't you just read it? That way you can kind of take it in at the same time. Okay, give is that it right there? Given that HPB 
Yeah. Okay, given that HPB and the teachers held Tsongkhapa in high spiritual esteem and his being related to the theosophical effort towards the end of every 100 year cycle, what might we know if anything of the following? What might be the theosophical understanding of his la, uh, uh, la, Lamrim teachings? What might we know of his pseudo esoteric teachings? Well, I, a couple of points did come up in the talk. One was um, that he was well aware of the sevenfold nature of life, of, of uh, human beings. And he was also aware of the dangers of a person who was not yet selfless uh, uh, would be posed in terms of the power that could be unleashed with the awareness of this sevenfold uh, composition that, that life is. So there was that. Uh, the, the other thing about the Lam Rim that was, um, that did come up was just why I talked about the, the 12 aspects of the dependent origination. I mean, HPG, HPB gives us uh, uh, a glimpse that we're supposed to take and 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 our own uh, uh, study and seeking out and figuring out, and so it, it, it a whole new idea of obligatory journey um, kind of hit me very hard in studying the Lam Rim because it gets into such detail. the The, the thing that I feel about the Lam Rim is. If you if you study it, first of all, I don't I I would love to say I understand it totally. That is not the truth. I don't. But the feeling that I get about it is that it is so specific. It would be difficult for you to not know where you are, where you think you are, and where you are. It really tells you all that it's the nuts and bolts of being on the path and the little nuances. Uh, in our personalities, in our skandhas, uh, uh, the, the composition of our being that have, until we get conscious of them, a big, they're running the show. They are running the show until we get conscious of them uh, and make the choice to get off this wheel uh, of rebirth. The other thing, what might we know of his pseudo esoteric teachings? I felt that the Guya Samaja could be just that I'm attached. I don't know what it is, but I felt that the Guya Samaja, the, it, when it began to talk about the subtle energies in our being that um, get revealed to, uh, to a, a yogi when they gain some proficiency in doing this process and, and that article I've forgotten the gentleman's name that, that I got the information from. He was very specific about warning to be careful about this because if you, uh, if, if, if you first of all, have not gen um, generated uh, the altruistic mind, and also if you don't really know what you're doing on these inner planes, uh, you could really cause great damage to yourself. So there is the, uh, the necess necessity and the benefit of having a teacher, but some things are pseudo, I guess pseudo esoteric is, we know we have uh, uh, an inner body, a subtle body and an external body. I mean, something like that. I may not be answering properly, but um, there's some measure of esoteric ideas available to us, even if we're not, uh, uh, evolved to the point where these uh, great yogis are. Okay, what if anything might we think theosophically of his yoga's difference from the Hindu yogas noted as karma, bhakti, and jnana yoga? I hope I understand this. But the thing I get about him is that he had the mission it was, his interest was really about blending the three. He was never satisfied with one aspect. You can, you can adopt some spiritual practice 
and never uh, embrace the others, which is okay. But his idea was that until you've embraced all three, the intellect, the heart, the action in the world of service, until you've done that, then you haven't really embraced uh, the path in its, in its fullness. And at some point you pay for it. But all we've got is today and the teaching. So, you know, maybe next week or maybe next incarnation, it's, all, it's, it's okay. But I think that it, it, what seemed to be very strong to this student's mind is that he really believed that the blend of all these different uh, aspects of the path is just one path. Uh, is very important. It's just like, who gets to be such a great master at all of them. Whoa. Um, what might the Theosophical Doctrine say of his nine blendings? I don't know. I I read very uh, superficially at, um, about the nine blendings, and I looked at it and I thought I have too much information already, and I let it go. And no, I'm sorry, I did. Uh, Burrs and Archives, Truth Collins has here, Alexander. Yeah, I think that's it, Truth. It's called Study Buddhism Now. And I just remember his last name is spelled B-E-R-Z-I-N. And he is a Guya Samaja yogi, if I remember correctly. So he had um, great understanding of what it was that Tsongkhapa was accomplishing. Uh, I think our time is up. However, um, I I anybody who would like, uh, what, what, Monica, would you be willing to stay on and uh, take a few more questions? It's totally up to you. Oh, absolutely. But Dr. Judy, there's Dr. Judy. Oh, I just have a, uh, a quick question. I, I was very impressed with your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Sankha Pa's poem that one of them they showed us seems to indicate that he would be committing a great sin, he thought, if he did not come back to earth in a body and that like, like he would be a, like a Pratikya Buddha. And I wonder if you know anything about his relationship with the historical person, a nun who became enlightened, a, a disciple of his called, she called herself Kuan Yin. And she took the pledge of Kuan Yin publicly, never to enter Nirvana, final peace alone, until forever and everywhere she had strived for the redemption of every creature upon this earth. Wow. And um, do you know much about his, her, his relationship with her? Because uh, the Tibetan women who attained enlightenment are little known or recognized. I learned this from a nun in Dharamshala, and there have been some great ones and this lady was one but again she just took the name of uh Kuan Yin the goddess of mercy I, I've never heard this story before can we google her to get information on her perhaps if I, I, I know no go go ahead I'm sorry well I learned it from Nandini Iyer who's passed away uh, but yeah. um I, I think we could Google her, find some information, perhaps in some theosophical text about her, because I know also that his nephew became the first Dalai Lama. But this person, uh, a woman, was a great disciple of his, and she made this public pronouncement, because uh, I guess there are so many people who start on the path and uh, say, well, you know, I want to have bliss. And then realize that's not where it is at all. Selfless, uh, in fact, well, that it's never, uh, extremely selfish. That's and, amazing. I never heard this story before. I would like to know more about her. I, I would too. We don't get to, we don't get to hear about uh, women initiates that often. Well, well, that's it. And this this elderly Tibetan nun told me there had been quite a few, but they simply weren't recognized. So we'll try to research this. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm going to have to go pretty soon, but thank you. And namaste. So you. Namaste. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Judy. Okay. I'll see everybody next week. Yeah, I'll see you next week, yes. Judy. You're, the, you're on. Religion, yes. religion yes. of solidarity.
So yeah, Bellamy, I'm looking forward to it, everyone. Okay, I'll see you soon. See you then. Any other uh, questions or comments for Monica? I think everybody, oh, there, is, there comes Anthony. Hi, Anthony. Oh, and we look after him. Monica. Yeah, it was just beautiful. Uh, thank you. Who's that? Uh, Who are you? That's Bob. That's, that's Hi, Bob and our secret Bob. doctor. Thank you very much, Bob. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for your efforts, for your study, for your dedication. You're not going to say it, but I will. Thank, thank you. Thank you for being an inspiration to many a student. This one as well. Now my now my question. <laughs> now. Now, Bowen, now, you know, Bowen in uh, How to uh, Study the Secret Doctrine uh, tributes, I believe, to HBB saying that the true student of the secret doctrine is a Yani uh, yoga, a yogi, and uh, this is, is the best uh, path for the Western So I was wondering, what, do you have any ideas on why Yana uh, yoga should be the, uh, the best uh, yoga for we Westerners? At least uh, as, as uh, it uh, stands for the secret doctrine. I, I'm not really sure. I have a couple of ideas about it. I, don't know, Anthony. I think a part of it was um, part of it is that there, at least in this student's mind, there's a perception that the, the Western vehicle may not be ready for some of these other disciplines. It, it might be too difficult. It might be uh, hazardous. So I think that that may be part of it. It's safer to sit in one's home and study these great ideas. It could also be that the Western mind uh, is more egotistical than the uh, mind of the, the Asian. So, Getting a hold of the ego uh, uh, with the intention of embracing the higher self, um, maybe that has something to do with it, you know, our studies. But I don't really know. Um, you know we, we have this, this cycle called the New Age where a lot of the Eastern influence has come to us and now uh, a tremendous amount of people live that way. So maybe our vehicles are much more acclimated than before. So I don't really have a answer, but those are the ideas that kind of float around in my head about it. Western versus, Western versus Eastern. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, Monica, I'm sorry, I, I have trouble with the internet, so I didn't get to see your whole presentation. So oh. I'm sorry for that. But what I saw was beautiful, inspiring. You were so hard, and, and it shows in your presentation. Like I said, it was absolutely lovely. Thank you for that. Now, since I didn't, I missed the first part, I was wondering what you said or, or rely, regarding the, the reason why he reincarnated in first place. It was to reform uh, the Buddhism. And it was because, and I know he was, a, he was the founder of the yellow caps and because of what the dark red caps were doing. I was wondering if you, if you touched on that or can you talk a little bit about it? Yeah, we definitely did uh, talk about that. I had found an article uh, about, um, about the theosophical view about this. And, and I was also reminded, Miluka, about, um, I think it was a Mr. Crosby article that spoke of how, you know, the, the masters are, are one and one knows what the other is doing and they're completely aware of cycles and this entire um, this uh, viewpoint of looking at the world and what it needs. And so according 
to this article uh, that I found on the Theosophical website. Let me see where it is. It basically talks about how Tsongkhapa really had a mission to purify uh, Buddhism in Tibet because it had uh, had uh, fallen due to materialism uh, and sorcery, and it the mission was to plant a seed uh, to purify. So once again, the um, uh, the tenets or what the Buddha taught would be available to people in a, 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 in a true way. Well, they were getting a watered down or a, a untrue version of what Buddhism was. So it seems to be saying that um, uh, theosophy was well aware and it's in, and here it is, it says, Tsongkhapa undertook two great tasks, the purification, preservation and promulgation of the wisdom religion and the initiation of the seven century plan. So these are things that are so far ahead of us. They see so far into the future. And it's like, this country here is not going to be doing well. So let's send, why don't we send Tsongkhapa over here, let him plant a seed, let it grow. That kind of idea, seventh century plan to prepare the world for mental and spiritual revitalization to be the seed ground for the formation of the distant sixth subrace. So it, it, what, he, what he, his mission was uh, to create uh, a preparation for cycles to come. Thank you. Um, recently, the Dalai Lama made some uh, confession uh, I, I, I read that he said that he was very disappointed even with the yellow caps because they were not following the right course of action. And it seems like there are some deterioration. It is. Yeah, I, I, uh, I was a little saddened. I saw him online weeks ago, this is weeks ago. And he announced that he would be here another 10 years. And that seemed curious to me that he would make a statement like that. It, it, first of all, it made me think, boy, are we in for a doozy and we need him here on this physical plane. Um, but it also, on the, other, on the other side, it sounded like heads up, get it together because I'm not gonna be here uh, much longer after that, so. I, I don't know what that has to do with, you know, his disappointment, but, you know, this is, the Kali Yuga is descending. What do we do? Thank you so much. Monica, could I mention something? Sure. First of all, when you just now said about what the Dalai Lama said, <laughs> amazing, just both responses just came into my head, right, when, that you just said, you know, it's just like, okay. Um but also, I was thinking in the case of the Nalanda tradition that went from the 5th century to the 12th century in India, um, the Dalai Lama, he says, if you really want to, under, want to understand all my books and all my philosophy, study the philosophers of the Nalanda tradition. And that was Atisha, Nar Nargarjuna, uh, Shantideva, all those people that you, he gets all that, you know, and um but just a corresponding thing of what you said about how these teachers, they think they look at big cycles, right? Um, and it was my understanding is I think it was in the 11th century that they started sending people to Tibet because they saw Nalanda coming to an end. Mm. And they started, they fired up Tibet before like a hundred years prior to Nalanda coming to an end. And Nalanda did come to an end. It was, it was sacked by invaders and, you know, very similar thing to what happened to Tibet with the violence and the, just the horrible, I mean, you very gently called it a political a tragedy, yeah. but we all know that it was, you know, murder. But, yeah. uh, but anyway, uh, it's interesting, like what you're saying about how these teachers, they see these big cycles and they, they function accordingly. So, yeah. 
who's going to be able to to um, to to listen to the uh, read that article uh, about Mr. Crosby. That's a good that was a good reminder of that idea. You know, each one knows what the other one is doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think uh, we've gone 25 minutes past. Um, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> that was just magnificent. Um, so just so many, 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 many thanks. So thank uh, you. For, and everybody who helped me know, you know who you are. No way, no <laughs> way I would have been able to do it without input. And I, I am so grateful. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Monica.